Welcome to Christ Life Ministries. We are living in a prophetic time frame similar to the uh, time when Jesus, after having raised from the dead, was preparing the church, the people, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was going to come on the day of Pentecost. So in the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, the Bible says he was teaching them things concerning pertaining to the kingdom. This same time frame is also seen in two other prophetic pictures or shadows. You find one in the book of Matthew where Jesus is uh, baptized he, he, has already, he already had the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God came upon him without measure and he was led into the wilderness again 40 days. And during that time, he was, of course, praying and, and talking to God and he was being prepared for the manifestation of the Spirit that, that had already been released. The Scripture tells in the book of Luke that he, well, he went into the wilderness full of the Spirit. Then he came out in the power of the Spirit. Those 40 days of temptation and instruction were crucial to prepare him for that subsequent manifestation. And the third uh, shadow we see is in uh, Genesis, in the book of Noah, in the book of Genesis during the flood of Noah. Noah's flood begins, but it is not until after 40 days the rain comes from heaven, which is a type of teaching of the Word of God, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, and, uh, and the, 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 the uh, depths of the sea, uh, a tsunami, what we call tsunami today, a tidal wave. There was an earthquake at the bottom of the ocean, so it caused the waters to rise up. And that was what filled the earth, in addition to the rain that was coming from heaven. And it was only after 40 days all the hills were covered. This is symbolic. And, and, and prophetic, speaking about the uh, uh, overcoming, you know, the covering of all satanic power, you know, which is uh, 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 typified by those hills. Everything was covered. And you see this in uh, um, Isaiah chapter 40, you know, talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, talking about the glory of God. and says that every mountain shall be brought low and every uh, valley will be filled and all the rough places will be, uh, crooked places will be made straight and the rough places will be made. This is teaching. Prophetic teaching that gets that job done. And that's what we're doing now. We are preparing the church, preparing you, I yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me, you know, for the manifestation of the Spirit without measure. So many Christians don't even know what's going on. And, and the Bible tells us in so many places, we just finished the book of 1 first, first Corinthians, it says, I will not have you ignorant. Sadly, a lot of our people are ignorant, hence these prophetic teachings. And we began to tell you what the kingdom was. The kingdom is the dominion, the total dominion of righteousness, peace, and joy. Or you can say love is the same thing. Love, righteousness, peace, and joy is the same as love because love has all the fruits of the Spirit, including peace and joy. And love never does wrong. So when you say righteousness, you're talking about love. The total dominion of the love of God on our will, mind, emotions, bodies, and circumstances. And it's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus teaches us further on this. He said that the kingdom of God allows, permits violence for the violent take it by force. The kingdom is not something that's just going to drop on you like ripe cherries. You've got to fight for it, so to speak, spiritually speaking now, you know, through prayer, confession, intercession, we're going to be seeing all of those things, you know, uh, in order for it to be made manifest in your life is a daily thing. Each day, the fact that you enforced the kingdom yesterday is no guarantee that the kingdom will enforce today. You have to enforce it. And this is one of the reasons, because many of us don't understand this, you know, why Jesus had to pray every day. Just son of God, sinless. Yet, the Bible says in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears and was heard in that he feared. And you find, you know, that this same truth, you know, you, you, you see it in his ministry that he took nothing for granted. Just would get up early in the morning. He would pray and enforce the kingdom for that day. And then when he was going to teach it to his disciples, they couldn't understand all that complication, you know. 
because the Holy Spirit was still going to come. Paul was still going to come and bring revelation knowledge, which is what I'm going to be doing here. You know, so he said in a simple way, what we call the Lord's Prayer. They saw his pattern. They saw how much Jesus prayed. You know, the Bible says he was in a certain place praying and when he ceased. In other words, he, he, they understood that Jesus had a pattern. Every day, he got up early in the morning and pray. Then during the day, you know, like we've been teaching us, four times every, you know, every six hours, he, he would withdraw and he would pray. So it was during one of those prayer sessions that he was having, they let him finish. So when he finished and he came out and started talking to them, they said, ah, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us. Ah, let, let us understand how you're doing these things. Then he gave it to them in a simplified nutshell. In a simplified fashion. He said, hmm. There's no way I can tell you what I do in two and a half, three hours every day. You won't understand it now. I have many things to say to you, but you're not ready to, you can't bear it now. He said, but anyway, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all of these things. But just take this for now. You know, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us, not temptation. A better understanding of that is lead us to avoid temptation. A lot of Christians go into temptation. That's stupid. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to avoid it. Avoid evil. Lead us to avoid temptation and deliver us from evil when it cannot be avoided. Not that we deliberately allow ourselves to walk into it. You know? And we shared with us that that kingdom there is the total domain of righteousness, peace, and joy in our earth. The earth is not only just the, 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 the continents and, you know, and, and the nations, but in our own earth, that is our physical bodies, our minds, our souls. It is, and it is the degree to which the kingdom of God is established in your earth that you can now, in turn, enforce the kingdom in the environment around you. It's one of the reasons why we haven't seen the degree of answered prayer that we all desire and know from the Bible. I gave the example of Elisha. In the days of Elisha, Elisha had the double portion and he paid a price for it. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just a gift. It was a reward for following Elijah, uh, his mentor, you know, consistently. And when the Holy Spirit, the, the, the mantle was dropped, he got the double portion. This Elijah, even though he was an Israelite, even though he was in Israel, he controlled nations. He, 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 he did what the Bible says, that kingdom come, that will be done. The, the dominion of God was, was manifest in Israel, you know. And then later on, you know, even outside Israel in Syria and places like that, he healed Naaman the, Syri the, the leper, you know. And, and the church needs to, must start enforcing manifesting the kingdom of God on earth. That's the purpose of the spirit without measure. Jesus said to them, he said, go into, you know, all the cities of Israel. Go to, you know, Bethsaida, go to Chorazin, go to, you know, uh, Capernaum, and all those uh, coastal cities, Tiberias, and all those coastal cities, and, you know, through all the, all the land of Israel. And then he says, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. He said, freely you've received, freely give. He said, and if they don't accept it, when you've done it, he said, shake the dust of your feet upon them. To, to them, as a testament against them, and tell them that the kingdom of God, the dominion of God has come to you. He said, that, he said he was the devil. You know, it was Beelzebub. He said that if... I, by the Spirit of God, use, use the word Spirit of God, use the word finger of God, just symbolisms. He said, by, cast out devils. He said, then by whom do your sons cast them out? He said, but if I do it by the Spirit of God, then you know the kingdom of God, the dominion of God. But it first of all has to be exercised in you before you can now exercise it externally. And that's the reason why we haven't seen it in any uh, 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 significant measure. We've seen it but not in a significant measure like we see in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in particular, you know, and some of the Old Testament prophets, you know, uh, like, like I mentioned, Elijah, you know, uh, Elisha, you know, Moses. 
Moses enforced the kingdom of God in Egypt. He enforced the kingdom of God, the dominion of God. The Egypt had their gods. They had the sun god. They had the god of water. They had the god of this. They had the god of that. He, he, uh, Moses went in there and destroyed the, 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 the dominion of the kings, the dominion of the gods of Egypt. He enforced the kingdom of God in Egypt. So much so that the king had to say, let, let them go. Let the people go. And that is going to be repeated on the earth today. A lot of Christians don't realize this. God is jealous for his glory. Very jealous. If you don't know God, you won't know that aspect of it. You don't know him properly. God is very jealous for his glory. And he is very irritated, if I can use that expression. You know, when people say all kinds of nonsense about God and his people are not strong enough to do anything about it. I remember, remember Goliath. Goliath came, the Bible said, again, another 40 days. <laughs> the Goliath comes 40 days speaking to the armies of Israel. Say, send me a man because he was about, they tell us he's about 13 feet tall, you know. I can let him fight with me and I'll fight with him and you become our slaves if I kill him. And if he kills me, we'll become your slaves. The Bible says all of Israel, including Saul, and all, they were all afraid until a young boy called David came and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that he should defy the armies of the living God. I will go and fight him, and I will feed his, his head and his body and the body to the, to the bowels of the earth. Then he said something that gladdened the, God, the heart of God. And we must repeat it. You know what he said? He said that all the earth may know. Ah! That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You know, if we look at the earth today, Look at Nigeria, look at don't know, England and America and all these countries where the gospel first came out of. You see the devil doing all kinds of silly things, saying all kinds of silly things. Boys are no longer boys, they are now girls. Girls are no longer girls, they are now boys. And, and I, I was just listening to a program, I think it was yesterday, and in, I think it's in, 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 in one, one state, in Washington, yes. So Washington is a state in, in somewhere in the north, northwest. That's where Seattle is, where Microsoft has have, have their headquarters. They, they just passed a legislation. It's on the governor's table as I speak, so to be signed. Where in as early as 13 years old, 13, 1, 3, 13, if your child decides that if he's a boy and he says, I think I feel I'm a girl. Or if he's a girl and she feels that I am a boy, they will take that child without your permission. Once she tells the counselor in the school, she does not, they don't need your permission. They will take the child to a government facility and they will do a surgical operation on the child and change the gender of a child without your input, God forbid. The church must rise in this hour. Nothing short of the, of the demonstration of the kingdom, the dominion of God will stop that nonsense. Hence, the significance of this series of messages. And so, we saw the kingdom this is all the things that the kingdom is. And we now began to see how to get this thing done. It begins, there's a road map. The love of God. Initially, it's a determination. You say it daily. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. That's where we stopped, you know. And I'm going to continue from there. You, you need to... A daily determination. It's not a weekly. It's daily. I learned this as a young Christian. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was being unconsciously led by the Holy Spirit. Under the tutelage of E.W. Kenyon through his books. He had died, he'd gone to heaven. But, he, you know, his books were around. You know, and, and Kenneth E. Hagen, you know, on the development of the human spirit. And, 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 and in his marvelous book, 
uh, the hidden man of the heart, E.W.K. E. teaches that. He said, I have found the solution to the development of the human spirit. We need to develop the love of God, the, the fruit of the spirit. And he says, 1 Corinthians 13, he said, we need to say it, think it, determine it daily. The, the, the one I want to really focus on, razor sharp on, is determine. Now, you don't just read it like a parrot. You've got to think and say, I determined to do this. Now, you may not do it perfectly. At the beginning, you won't actually. I can tell you from experience and from the Word of God, it says it's the least of all the seeds in the earth. But as you grow, you will begin to have dominion. It says it becomes greater than all the herbs. And even the fowls of the air come. Now, other people will come and take shadow, um, 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 take comfort under the shadow of the influence of the love of God that is emanating from you. And so, you know, you need to do this daily. A determination. Inside love is humility. Inside love is honesty. All of it is inside this love of God. Then from there, you pray Pauline prayers every day. Again, I was led. I, I, I didn't know. I heard Kenneth Hagin do it and I just copied. Simple. Very simple. And his experience was my experience. Six months. When I first started, it just after some, you know, when you do it for first three days, four days, a week, a month, after that, it looks mechanical. <laughs> I'm saying just the same thing. And you're not so, I'm getting any revelation. And in fact, I remember, you know, as a young Christian, I was in Imperial College then, you know, it's 1979, 1980. You know, <laughs> you know, as a young boy, I was only 21 years old. You know, I was expecting to get the same experience Kenneth Hagin had. So I was expecting maybe Jesus was going to enter my room one day. <laughs> you know, I was half expecting that. You know, thank God Ken Higgins had taught us that, you know, you shouldn't go and seek for vision. So I didn't. But I just had an expectation in my eyes. After, after all, Lord, I've been praying this prayer. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I've been doing it every day. Uh, by now, after three months or, you know, I, at least I expect some, some encouragement. Now, maybe just walk into my room one evening and say, I will be, I've been doing very well. Okay. You know, but sadly that did not happen. You know, and rightly so. God doesn't do that. But you know, six months. I can never forget it. Six months. I started, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in November 79. I started doing these prayers, let's just say, you know, January. December, you know. It was about May, around my birthday. May, around this time, you know. I went for camp meeting in July. Yeah, so it was somewhere between May and June. It was exactly six months. One day, I just got up and read my Bible. It's like, it's like a, 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 a tap was opened. A torrent of revelation. Ah! I said, this is what Kenneth Hagin is talking about. I was 21 years old. I wrote an article called The Hope of, of, our Glo the Hope of Glory. It's still, it's, it's on our website. You would think I wrote it today. I wrote it then. Revelation began to pour into my heart. That was what made me leave Imperial College and obey the call of God. It was in the light of that revelation, you know. So what I'm saying to you is that it's, it's a road map. You need the determination, the decision, the, the honesty, the humility, then the Pauline prayers, which are actually specialized life scriptures. When you pray from Pauline prayers, you get then praying in the spirit and then reading your Bible. That's the, that's the fourth step. When you follow that, it's the path of life. When you follow those four steps, you will come, all the other things, life scriptures, groaning, they're all down the road. You are going to, that's what happened to me. You come, you come to them. So today, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I believe we're in verse 5. We're looking at this last week. I want to take, aha. Now, look at the Amplified, please. Amplified. The Amplified Version. Thank you. This is what I learned from Kenneth Hagen. Kenneth Hagen said, you use the Amplified Bible. So I use the Amplified. I didn't use the King James for my meditations and confessions. Now, there's another aspect of the love of God. Like I told you, the love of God is really the fruit of the Spirit. All the nine fruit of the Spirit are inside the love of God. Love is the original thing. Because God is love, you see. So all those things are just components. They're just parts of the, of the love of God. What the list you see in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 is the noun. 
Now, what it is, joy, peace, long-suffering. But what you see in 1 Corinthians 13 is the verb, what it does in interpersonal relations. And this is crucial. These scriptures tell us how we are to behave one toward another and toward all other men. And so this tells us that love is not conceited. It's not arrogant. It's not inflated with pride. It's not rude. It's not unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. These are things you need to get ingrained into your will and your mind and determine to practice. These were the things that guided me in those early days. And I still do it till today. You haven't stopped. You know? And you know, people used to think foolishly and uh, ignorantly that I'm a weak person. If you want to argue, you know, I find I kind of, kind of just, <laughs> you know, I, I avoid confrontation. I avoid... Is this thing because I had ingrained it into me? I, I, I'm not rude, I'm not unmannerly. I'm sure I told you this story before, and it's, it, it's, it's contextual, so I'm going to mention it. You know, my mother, who's gone home to be with the Lord, and her senior sister, uh, Mrs. Biobaku, who's also uh, died and gone to be with God, you know, they came to pick me in Ibadan you know, and told me a lie that my grandmother was sick, that the, my grandmother wanted to see me in Lagos. To cut a long story short, they took me to Luth and took me to the psychiatric ward because they thought something had happened to me, you know, mentally. And they were, you know, I was livid. Talk about angry. I was angry, you know, that one, they deceived me. Number two, they put me in a room in, in, in Luth, you know, with one small doctor. I'm sure I was his senior in, in university. You know, one young doctor like this probably was a house officer or a registrar or something. You know, and the guys are clacking me. Okay, what's wrong with you? I laughed. You know, and I told him, I said, and, and the Holy Spirit, you see, they're learning these things, not rude on manali. The Holy Spirit says, he said, don't be rude, though. You are angry. Don't be unmannerly. They will say you are really mad. <laughs> this was what helped me. So I just calmed down. So I smiled at the guy. I said, I'm an SU. You know what that means? Scriptural union. I'm, I'm a Christian, born again. He said, and my parents are worried. I said, there's nothing wrong with me. And they asked me some other questions. I told him, what my background was. I just came back from England. I started a very strong uh, British accent at that time, you know. And he just looked at me, shook his head. He laughed because he knew there was nothing wrong with me. So he told my parents, you know, that there's nothing wrong with me. And then they discharged me the next day. And I was very angry with my mother. Very angry. Then this thing helped me. He said, she's your mother. Don't be rude. Don't be, no matter how justified you feel and provoked don't act unbecomingly what she did and your aunties did my mom my my auntie and my other auntie all of them are dead now you know who's a professor she was a professor in a, of medicine in, in in luth it was through her they got all the doctors and everything you know he said they thought they were doing what they thought was best he said don't be angry so now pick up the phone. Those days we didn't have, there was no mobile phone. So I had to go to maintenance. Thank you. Uh, you know, how life has changed. How life has changed. This, this, is, this is 1980 or 81. How life has changed. To phone Lagos in those days, I had to go all the way to UI. Maintenance. Then you wait, oh, because there's a queue. You take your time. So I, I, I now called my mother from the, from the booth. And the, and the Holy Spirit said, don't be rude. Don't be unmannerly. And I said, mommy, is Ulubi? She said, yes. I said, I'm fine. 
I say, I understand what you are trying to do. But let me assure you, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm fine. And in a few years' time, you will see it. And I love you. And uh, finish you. You know, from that day, my mother never again. Love never fails you. But you know, if I said, in Jesus' name. That Islamic spirit. Because they were all Muslims. And you know, that's what some stupid brethren would have counseled me to do. Thank God I wasn't moving in those circles. They will tell you, ah, it's the spirit of your grandfather that is walking through your parents. They want to keep you in bondage. Yeah. So you will re rebuke the spirit. You will, ah, can I rebuke my own mother? Foolishness. And it's still rife in the church till today. Lack of wisdom. They don't know the word of God. It's not that nonsense that's going to get you delivered. It's love. Love. God's love in us does not insist on its own right or its own way for it is not self-seeking. I want to spend a little bit of time on this. We're talking about things pertaining to the kingdom. These are the things you must ingrain. In, in the book of Hebrews, it said that this is the covenant. I will write my law upon their hearts and upon their minds. And they will not say, know the Lord, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. How do you do that? You, you have to say it every day. Practice it every day. Make mistakes, fall, confess your sin, stand up again. A just man falls seven times and he rises again. It is that continuous process that writes it in your heart. After a while, that's how you will think. That's how you will behave. That's how you will react. I'm telling you from personal experience. Now, this one is very important. Notice it doesn't say love does not ask for its own right. It does. But it does not insist. Big difference. I'm not a fool. I know what my rights are. And if I demand them. But once it wants to turn into a quarrel, I back off. That's love. It doesn't, it's not, love is not foolish. <laughs> it's not weak. It's wise. You who want to fight... You are not strong. You're foolish. Love does not insist. It will make a demand and say, this is what I think should be done. Once the, you know, the Bible says, leave off contention. Tango in the book of Proverbs. We're going to come to it. He said, he says, he says leave off contention before it be meddled with. Once he wants to turn into a quarrel, you don't say it's not your right. You just keep quiet. And allow God to walk inside the situation. And when, it, when, when, when the situations are such that, you know, um, you, it's something that is very, it's fundamental. You still say it's your right. But you, you, the Bible says, with meekness and reverence. I'll give another story. This was again in my early days when I just came back from England. I didn't have much wisdom, although I was practicing these things, and it helped me tremendously. When I look back now, I, God helped me to overcome the obstacles I had in my family and with my parents. I told you a bit of my mom. On my dad's side, there were also problems. My grandfather, you know, was a Roscrucian. Persecution. And I had read in the Bible that this stargazing and, and foolishly, <laughs> I told my dad, I told my grandfather, I said, I said it nicely. I, I, didn't, I was not rude or manner. I just said, ah, this is the devil. Oh. Ah! Hey! <laughs> hey! Olubi! You know, my, my, my grandfather and my dad were very wise men. I'm looking back now. 
They didn't fight me. They didn't throw me out of the house. They just said, You know, but this thing, 